the wave properties of, of matter. And so let's take a look. At, let me, let's see this 3D standing wave machine. Actually, we'll go to the 2D standing waves. Use diagrams to explain what a three-dimensional wave is. Apply the properties of two-dimensional waves to three-dimensional waves and solve real-life problems involving water waves. Longitudinal waves and transverse uh, waves are seen to spring. Let's fast forward here. Properties yeah. of views so that we're looking at the way to show the diagram more detail. We can same with actually, actually sorry, this is not the one I want. Parallel lines to represent um I think is this it? All right, here we can see some um, 2D standing waves. You can, you can also go and, and look at some 3D, search around here. But you know, this would be an allowed energy there, another allowed energy. And so it jumps from one allowed energy to another allowed energy. You know what those pictures are here. <laughs> Fast forward here. There we go. So it has to jump up to the next allowed energy, which is there. That would be allowed, but everything between those was forbidden, so nothing happened. There's the next allowed energy, right there. Do you see that? And so you're going through an allowed energy and then a whole bunch of forbidden energies and then boom, another allowed energy. All right, so um, this goes through a whole bunch, I think. Let's go fast forward here. So um, there are a whole bunch of allowed energies, and there are a whole bunch of forbidden energies. In fact, for the hydrogen atom, how many allowed energies are there? How many allowed energies are there for a hydrogen atom, for the electron in the hydrogen atom? You know? You know? Uh, we can figure it out. Um, we can figure out for the hydrogen atom, you'll see uh, the lowest energy is going to be n equals 1. The highest energy will be n equal 
the highest energy for the hydrogen atom be? Infinity. Stop this here. Um, <clears throat> N equals infinity would be the highest energy. And so how many states are there between one and infinity? Infinite. And so there are infinite number. If there's an infinite number of allowed states, then isn't it just continuous? No. Because if there's an infinite number of allowed states, then it ought to be continuous because it seems as if everything should be allowed. But uh, oddly, um, there, there are also uh, plenty of forbidden states here as well. And so if we go from um, n equals 1 to n equals infinity, we can map out all the states. We map out all the states by following a simple set of mathematical rules. The Schrodinger equation has certain restrictions on it. And so if we look at the Schrodinger equation, it looks something like this. You know, the restrictions here are, are this. You know, psi is going to depend on, basically we solve this and we get an equation because, you know, to, to come up with a set of infinite answers would be too much. And so what we do is we get an, an algebraic equation. The algebraic equation I'm not going to write here, but the algebraic equation is going to have three variables. And uh, for those three variables, um, there are limited set of numbers that works for each of these and there are restrictions there. And so we have our restrictions for N, L, and M, right? Mathematical restrictions. And in order to be a, a, a solution or an answer to the Schrodinger equation, uh, these are restricted to certain values. And we know what those values are. Do you guys write that down, right? Okay. Then we see some other patterns arise from here. Um, one, the, the energy here, this energy is gonna depend on um, primarily N and, and Z. And Z for um, you know, a single electron species, a single electron. Uh, for multi-electron, it's N and L for multi-electron. All right, from these mountains, we aren't actually gonna solve the Schrodinger equation, it, although it's not difficult to solve for um, the hydrogen atom. Um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use these mathematical restrictions to generate the states and then kind of figure out what, what they all mean. And so when we have something like a psi one zero zero, you know, what we generate is we generate a, a wave function Let's say this is the nucleus here at zero. And so it's a, this mathematical function that looks like, like this, uh, where, you know, it raises up. We call this, um, you know, plus so this positive amplitude there. both sides, it's symmetric on both sides. And so this is psi plotted against r, you know, the distance from the nucleus. And we can see the, you know, peaks out near the nucleus and then drops as we get farther away. Well, this is for the one zero zero. Psi one zero zero looks like this. And what we're interested in is this, uh, we're interested in psi squared. You know what psi squared represents? Psi squared represents the probability it's the probability for finding an electron you know, whose 
So this is not the scale, but you square all these values and they come up with something like this. So it looks the same. It's just everything's square. It's positive amplitude. Now, what this tells us is when we look at this, the higher the probability, you know, then the more likely we are to find the electron at that distance. And so here, the further and further we get away from the nucleus, the lower and lower the probability gets. But the funny thing is, the probability doesn't go down to zero. Where does the probability go down to zero? You know, the psi squared approaches zero at r infinity. And so there's an there's a exceedingly small probability it could be at very far distance from, from the nuclear. But it is really, uh, really small. And so the way we, we map this out is, you know, there are different ways we can represent um, the probability uh, distribution. One way we can represent the probability distribution is by electron cloud. And so if we put the nucleus in the center there, then we see, you know, the electron cloud is gonna be thickest near the nucleus and then drop off. And we show the electron cloud with dots, so we draw the highest density of dots near the nucleus. You know, this is like pinpointing the position of the bird. And then as we go further and further out from the nucleus, you know, it thins out the number of dots. And then by the time we're way out here, you know, there's very little probability can be found right here. And so the greatest probability. We call this a 1s orbital. You know, this is for 1, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0 is a 1s orbital. All right, and so this is electron cloud. What we do next is, uh, is we can take a look at 95% of the area under this curve. If we look at 90, what is it, 95 or 90? No, 90, 95% of the area. 95% is what I was thinking, but um, it could be 90%. Some limit out here. You know, if we get uh, like 90% or 95% of the area under this curve, then there's only like a 5% uh, probability that it's outside this, this region. And so what we call this is we call it a 90% or a 95% boundary. Maybe I should use 90%. But uh, so we capture 90, 95% of the dots. We should look through that. And we'll get a boundary like this. So we'll call it the 90 or 95% boundary. depending on how much you want to capture. And so what that results in is something that looks like this for the 1s orbital. In which, you know, 1s orbital is just a ball, which is a sphere. And um, that, you know, 95% or 90% probability finding the electron inside, 5% finding it outside. And so this is the boundary. So this is the shape of the orbital, what we call the shape. The shape is given by L. You know, when L equals zero, we have a spherical shape or an S orbital. Now, um, we're going to jump up. Uh, this is psi one zero zero. Now we're going to jump up to N equals two. When we jump up to N equals two, we have a psi two zero zero orbital, or what we call a two S orbital. 2s orbital is going to have a little different look to it. The 2s orbital is, is uh, when we look at psi for a 2s orbital, it looks like this.
where um, when you look at the curve, there's negative amplitude and there's positive amplitude. So this is positive here, this is negative here, positive here. And then when we take a psi squared, you know, the psi squared, what happens is, um, uh, well, negative squared is going to give us a, a positive. This is called um, phase. You know, positive amplitude is So psi squared is always going to be positive amplitude, right? This is the wise probability because you wouldn't have a negative probability. And so we get something like this for this psi squared up here. But we lose um, the phase information. That is, we don't know if the wave function is a positive amplitude here or negative amplitude because psi squared is always positive, right? It's like when you take a, the square root of 4. If you take the square root of 4, it's plus or minus two but you know which is it is it plus two or is it minus two right. and so so we don't want to lose track of that because um, it makes a difference you know how these waves interact with other waves whether it's negative amplitude or positive amplitude and so what we do is we keep track of the phase information by just writing a plus and a minus there that's it there's an interesting feature of this wave, and that is this. This area where we have zero amplitude, or zero probability. This is called a node. Yeah. A node is a, a place where you're going to see zero probability. There are actually two nodes. There's a node at infinity where there's zero probability, and then there's a node here. For the 1s orbital, there was no node you know, what we call an internal node. There was just an external node. And so there's another mathematical pattern here. You know, um, what were the other mathematical patterns that you, you know? They're n squared orbitals, right? For each n. That's something we saw. There are n squared orbitals for each n. The next mathematical part pattern is that there are n minus 1 internal nodes. And so uh, for the 1s orbital, you know, there are n minus 1, there are zero internal nodes here. But for 2s orbital, there are going to be 2 minus 1, there's going to be one internal node. That one internal node is what we call spherical node. It's a spherical node because when we look at the um, when we look at the uh, electron cloud, here's the nucleus here. We look at the electron cloud. Um, you're going to see the highest probability is going to be near the nucleus, like a 1s orbital. It's near the nucleus. It's going to be bigger, right? Let's say if we're comparing this to 1s orbital, you know, the 1s orbital is going to be um, smaller, like this. This might be the 1s orbital here. They overlap in the same region, so 1s electron can be in the same region as a 2s electron, right? But the 2s electron is more energetic, and so it's the electron cloud is going to look a bit different. And then what we're going to have is we're going to have a nodal surface or a nodal uh, sphere here. And so this is going to just insert this in three dimensions. There's zero probability of finding electrons there. And then as we go out, then we'll have this, the 2s stuff continue. And then this drops down to zero the further out we get. <clears throat> and so in terms of a, a probability boundary, a 2s orbital is going to look the same. It's just bigger. And inside that sphere, there's going to be an internal node of zero probability. Okay. This is a 2s orbital. I showed the 1s orbital in here in green just for comparison. 1s orbital. Yeah, the blue would be the 2s orbital. A 3s orbital is going to have how many nodes? Two internal nodes. So 3s orbital is going to be bigger. Right? This 
more energy. And then there's going to be two internal spherical nodes in there. When we have n equals 2, we also have um, L equals, this is L equals 0. We also have L equals 1. So this is L equals 1. And so um, this is L equals 0. So when we have L equals 1, then we have 3m values, right? So this would be 2, 1, negative 1. 2, 1, 0, and 2, 1, 1. And so what, what do these look like? Well, what they look like is, is, is this. Um, basically, we are going to have a, uh, let's see, something that looks like this. So here we have some positive amplitude here to go way out to the negative amplitude. Say this is along the x-axis. This is our sum. Right? This is our psi. Um, psi squared is going to have all positive amplitude. Psi squared is one. Psi squared is So when we look at the this 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 hump came from the positive amplitude of the wave function. This hump came from the negative amplitude of the wave function. So we keep track of it that way. And then we can do an electron cloud. Electron cloud is going to look um, like this. The nucleus here. Cloud is we're going to have a uh, high probability this kind of region here, and then it's going to drop off, and then it's a high probability in this region here. This is a positive. All right, so this is a two, n equals two, so we have two minus one nodes. We have a different kind of node here. This is a nodal plane, and uh, we can see that here. This is your p orbital, it's your px orbital. So your px orbital, you know, we have electron density here, here, and then a nodal plane. This is just one orbital. We have three of these. You know, we, we have three of them based on the m value. And so we have a px, which is this. We have a py, which is this. Just along a different axis. And then we have a pz, which is this. This is a pz. This is two pz. If you look, um, this is all the orbitals. You have the 1s here. Actually, inside here, you can't see it. And then you have the 2s here. This would be the surface for the 2s. And then you have the px here. You can see the two lobes sticking out. You have the py here and the pz here. So those are the orbitals. So we've got three of those with different orientation. What would the um, 3p look like? Well, the 3p are going to look just like this, except they're going to have... one more node. And um, they're going to have this planar node here. They're going to have bigger lobes here, but there's going to be an internal node here like this. And so that would be the higher energy piece. All right. And so we have the 3s, which would have two. We have the 3p, and then we have the 3d. So let's take a look at the 3d um, next. The 3D, we have five of those because the 3D are going to have L equals 2. We have L equals 2. We're going to get psi 3, um, 2, minus 2, 
side 3, 2, 1, minus 1, side 3, 2, 0, side 3, 2, 1, side 3, 2, 2. Well, those are the m values that we're allowed for that. And uh, when we have n equals 3, we're going to have two nodes. And so here's a d, this is a d, what we call a dxz, because it's in the xz plane. This dxz has four lobes. It's cut by two nodes, a planar node here and a planar node here. And so there are two nodes cutting this. We have four lobes. This is just one orbital. We have a xz. We have a yz for an alternate plane. We have an xy. We have what we call an x squared minus y squared. If you look at this one, what's the difference between an xy and an x squared minus y squared? Can you see? The difference is in the xy, the lobes are between the axes. In the x squared minus y squared, they're along the axes. And so these, these would be two allowed states with electron. And then we have a funny one that looks kind of like a p orbital. These have two planar nodes, but this one has <clears throat> kind of strange. It has two conical nodes, like cones. And there's a cone coming out here that's a node, and a cone coming down here that's a node. And so this has two conical nodes. This is a, what we call a dz square. And so uh, the orbitals, you don't have to you don't have to memorize these, but we give you know names to these like dxy, dxz, dyz, dx squared minus y squared, and dz squared. Okay. But in this way, we can build up you know all the allowed states uh, for the oops this for the hydrogen atom. But you know the hydrogen atom, the energy just depends on n. And so, I, you know, I made a mistake here. These should be what we call energetically degenerate. For example, the p orbitals, all the p orbitals have the same energy. Because if you look at the shape, they're all the same, right? And so their interaction with the nucleus is going to be the same. And so these p orbitals have the same energy. But why would the s orbital have the same energy here? And this is a 1s. Unfortunately, we don't have a 2s. And so what's odd is this. In the hydrogen atom, I, I, made, I made a mistake here. These should be the same energy. Same energy we call a, a degenerate. They should be the same energy for um, single electron species. They should, they're the same energy for a single electron species because even though they have different shapes, they have the same effective distance from the nucleus. You know, and so what we do is we normalize it over three dimensions. So for example, a 2s orbital, you know, where is it most likely to be found? And compare it to 2p orbital, where is it most likely to be found? And then normalize it over the entire atom, and we get that these two orbitals have the same effective distance. You know, um, we'll talk about the effective distance in the next chapter. And so, for example, n equals 1 has an effective distance of 53 picometers. You know, it's as if you, uh, it's, you could treat that whole sphere, like if you just say, OK, I'm going to treat this whole sphere and then just figure out you know, where the electron's most probable distance from the nucleus is. Well, the m most probable distance seems right at the nucleus, but it's a little bit more tricky than that. But when we, when we figure it out, it comes out at 53 picometers. That's the effective distance of a 1s orbital. For 2s orbital, the effective distance is going to be n squared times 53, which would be 4 times 53, 212 picometers. And so 2s orbital has an effective distance around the nucleus of 212 picometers. But oddly enough, a 2p has the same effective distance, even though it's a totally different shape. And so their interaction with the nucleus is the same for both of these. 
And the same thing happens with the threes, you know? Um, they're all uh, the same. And so when we're looking at electron transitions, actually, let's, let's do one more thing before we do that. When we're looking at electron transitions, um, for example, uh, n equals 5. If, we, if we're at n equals 5, it drops down to n equals 2, then it emits light. So n equals 3 to n equals 2 emits red light in hydrogen. n equals 4 to n equals 2 would be green. n equals 5 to n equals 2 would be blue. And so let's take a look at the n equals 5 to n equals 2 transition. And so here we have the 2s and the three 2ps. The 2ps are going to be the same energy because this is what we call a single electron. In fact, we're just looking at the h hat. In the n equals 5, now there's an electron in n equals 5. What, where could it be? Well, let's figure out where that electron might be. The electron could be in a 5s orbital, right? Electron could be in a 5s orbital. The electron could be in a 5p orbital. The electron could be in a 4d. Actually, um, for the hydrogen atom, there's no 4d here. It's just going to be n equals 5. All the orbitals are going to be energetically degenerate because the hydrogen atom it only depends on n. And so uh, it could be in a 5d. It could be in a five, what comes after D? It could, come in, it could be in a five F orbital. How many lines should I draw for five F? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not memorized memorize it. Seven, five F. Um, or it could be in a could it be in a A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Could it be in a 5G orbital? Yes or no? Could it be in a 5G orbital? Yes or no? Is a 5G orbital allowed or forbidden? How would you know? Uh, 5H, 5I, allowed or forbidden? How you know is you solve the Schrodinger equation, but you don't have to solve the Schrodinger equation because something, somebody simplified the answers for you. And the answers fit a simple pattern, right? The, what are the, what's a simple pattern that the answer? Well, I, I know an S orbital is L equals zero, a P orbital is L equals one, a D orbital is L equals two, an F orbital is L equals three, a G orbital is L equals four, an H orbital will be L equals five. Is an H orbital allowed? H orbital is forbidden, why? This is forbidden, why? An H orbital is forbidden because it wouldn't solve the Schrodinger equation. It's a forbidden energy. Right? The L value is too big for our given N value. Well, how about a G orbital? Is G orbital allowed or forbidden? A G orbital is allowed. Now, how many G orbitals do I have? I know I have seven F orbitals. How many G orbitals do I have? Well, you could figure out in one of two ways. One, you could just use the little equation, the, you know, from the pattern, the empirical equation. The empirical equation is there's two L plus one, and so there's nine orbitals. So we know there are nine orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine orbitals there. That's one way, you know, two L plus one. 
There are two L plus one orbitals for every L. What's the other way? The other way is just figure them out. You know, what are the n values? The n values will tell you how many orbitals there are. And so the n values are going to be, now I'm running out of room, so I'm going to call this a 5, 4, what's the first one? The first one is going to be a 5, 4, minus 4. The next one is going to be a 5, 4, minus 3, followed by 5, 4, minus 2, 5, 4, minus 1, 5, 4, 0, 5, 4, 1, 5, 4, 2, 5, 4, 3, and 5, 4, 4, because n values range from minus L to plus L. And so the two ways we could have figured out there were nine orbitals and just count them. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine orbitals. And so if an electron is in the n equals 5, then it's in one of these orbitals here. And then when that electron drops down, but all these orbitals are degenerate. What does degenerate mean? That means they're the same energy, right? Why is this the same energy? Well, oddly enough, they have the same effective distance, even though they have totally different shapes to them. You know, how many nodes are there going to be? We get to n equals 5. How many nodes are there? Four. Four nodes. So these orbitals have funky shapes. You know, they were cut by planar nodes, spherical nodes, conical nodes, whatever. So they're going to have a very odd looking shape. And so electron drops here, and then we have that transition, you know, uh, blue photon uh, is emitted. So electron goes from here down to here. And so this is, you know, in Bohr, Bohr just said it's the fifth orbit, you know, the fifth orbit. Well, it, it, in a way, it is kind of like that because all these are going to have to go to the same effective distance, you know, five, what is it, five squared, 25 times uh, 53 picometers distant. But it's not orbiting, you know, because we have an electron cloud and we can't pinpoint the electron. Electron drops from here down to here and then it's going to emit a blue photon. Or if, if it gets promoted from here to here, it absorbs a blue photon. Normally, this electron is not up here. This is what we call an excited state. Normally, the electron is down here at the 1s orbital. The 1s orbital is what we call the ground state. You know, that's where it is. But you can excite the electron to higher and higher. In fact, we can excite the electron all the way to n equal infinity, like 1,500 kilojoules or so per mole. All right, so are there 25 orbitals here all together? 25 orbitals? Yeah. And so we can, um, you know, take time, but we can map out all the orbitals for the hydrogen atom. All right, so this is the quantum mechanical interpretation of the hydrogen atom. Let's go to multi-electron. When we go to multi-electron, um, the Schrodinger equation becomes very difficult to solve. And so we use approximation methods to solve. So for the hydrogen atom, the Schrodinger equation can be solved exactly. For the multi-electron atoms, approximation methods are required to solve the Schrodinger equation. But one of the major differences between the one-electron species and the multi-electron species is the energy. The energy now depends on N and L. Why does the energy now depend on the shape? The energy depends on the shape because of something called shielding and, and penetration. Now depend on shape. We 
have uh, we keep track of shielding and penetration. In um, in a hydrogen atom or one electron species, there's no shielding and no penetration. You know, hydrogen atom would have plus one in the nucleus, so one electron species like helium plus would have plus two in the nucleus to draw in the electron closer. But if we compare a, a 2s electron versus a 2p electron, they're gonna have the same energy. Same energy. Because oddly enough, they have the same effective distance from the nucleus. You know, same energy. That's not the greatest uh, 2p drawing there, but that's 2p. In multi electron, Okay, so we're going to go to a lithium. We go to lithium. Lithium has three electrons, and each orbital has a maximum capacity of what? How many electrons can we fit in one orbital? You guys remember? Two electrons we could fit in one orbital. And so for lithium, um, lithium has three protons in the nucleus, plus three charge. Now, one of the things is the more charge there is in the nucleus, let's say you're a 1s electron. If you're a 1s electron and you see 3 plus versus a 1s electron that sees 1 plus, what are you going to be more attracted to? 3 plus. And so this is like a stronger attractor beam on sci fi. In other words, a 1s orbital in lithium is much smaller than a 1s orbital in hydrogen. So let's just do this as 1s orbital here. The hydrogen 1s orbital is going to be much bigger. Why is the hydrogen 1s orbital going to be much bigger? Less protons. So having the more protons there pulls the electron in. When the electron gets close to the nucleus, it becomes more stable. And so when we look at the energy level diagram, the 1s orbital for hydrogen is like here, but the 1s orbital for lithium is lower in energy. It's lower in energy, more stable, and closer to the nucleus, smaller. But anyway, we can fit uh, two electrons in the 1s orbital. Okay. Now we have a choice. For the third electron, should we put that in a 2s? So the third electron, should we put it in the 2s orbital? Or should we put it in a 2p orbital? Or does it matter? Two s or two p or well, they, they both have the same effective distance, so it shouldn't matter, right? It shouldn't matter, except you know, except when we look at the probability, because the electron doesn't stay at that effective distance forever. It's not like it's orbiting, or it's not like it, it's staying there. What we see here is this: when we look at the probability of the two s, the highest probability is near the nucleus. Right? And then there's going to be a node, and then there's some probability further from the nucleus. Yeah. Like that. Whereas in a 2p orbital, the probability is going to be out here. The highest probability is out here, further away from the nucleus. Then it's going to drop out.
and so what we say here is this, a 2s electron is more penetrating. More penetrating, that is, it can get around the 1s electron. So all of a sudden this 2s electron might pop closer to the nucleus than the 1s electron. The closer the electron gets to the nucleus, the more stabilized it becomes. Lower in energy, electrical attraction. Versus here, what's the probability that this is going to pop in front? Let's say the 1s electron moves over here. You know, what's the probability? Well, the probability drops way down. You know, as, as you get closer and closer to the nucleus, there's fewer and fewer dots right there in the overall scheme. Most of the dots are out here. And so when we talk about penetration, we talk about which electron has a greater probability of being found next to the nucleus or closer to the nucleus, a 2s electron or a 2p electron. The other way we could look at it is we could look at it based on the size squared. If you look at the size squared, a 2s electron versus a 2p electron. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna superimpose the 1s electron. 1s electron is gonna be out here somewhere. one has more blue near the nucleus, the 2s electron. And so we call the 2s electron more penetrating. You know, it can get into the 1s electron space. Basically. And so the 2s is more penetrating. Because what happens is a 1s electron blocks or shields the nuclear charge from the electron, the 2s electron. And so what we're seeing here is this 1s is trying to, well, it's not trying to, it just shields, it shields the charge. And so here we can see that the 2p electron is more shielded, less penetrating. The 2s electron is less shielded, more penetrating. That only happens with multi-electrons multi because you need more than one electron because if you only have one electron, there's no shielding. If you always have one electron, it's a straight shot to the nucleus and you can see the full charge, nuclear charge. And so we have something called Z effective here. Okay. Z is the nuclear charge, which is our number of protons, which is three, right? And Z effective here is going to be how much of that charge it actually sees. And so here, Z effective is going to be uh, less than three, but Z effective here is going to be significantly less than three. This is a, the shielding. And so the more nuclear charge it sees, the better. We'll talk about Z effective in more detail, in particular the next chapter. And so the result is this. As far as penetration and shielding, the S orbitals are the most penetrating. S are more penetrating than the P, than the D, etc. As far as shielded goes, the S are the least shielded, 
And as we go out, they become progressively more shielded. And so in terms of energy, it goes like this. You know, for a given n, as L increases, the energy increases. And so um, a 2s is lower in energy than a 2p. A 3s is lower in energy than 3p, lower than energy of 3d, etc. And so we generate a new pattern for the orbitals. And the new pattern for the orbitals would just look like this. This is for multi electrons. The 1s is going to be the lowest in energy here, which is a 1, 0, 0. And then followed by a 2s, two, so 2, 0, 0. And then the 2p's, it's not huge, the difference in energy. It's just slightly greater in energy. So the 2s and the 2p are essentially the same. The 2p, but the 2p are slightly, slightly higher. All right, and then we go to the 3s. We have the 3s, which is a 3, 0, 0. And then the 3p are slightly higher in energy here. 3, 3p, 3, 3, three, three um, 2, minus 2, 3, 2, minus 1, 3, 2, 0. Oops, not 2, 3, 1, minus 1, 3, 1, 0. But what happens here is the 4s, the 4s is more penetrating than the 3d. And so the 4s actually pop in here, 4s. And then um, it goes like this. It goes 4s and then the 3d come next. 3d, 3D aren't very penetrating. And then the 4p. Yeah. And so we have um, something that's a little bit uh, tricky sometimes. This is called the first shell. And uh, the energy levels, the n equals 1 energy level. n equals 1 energy level. The first shell of orbitals because uh, they have about the same energy. And since these two have about the same energy, we call this the second shell. Second shell. The second shell just so happens to be the n equals 2 energy level. But if we look at the third shell, the third shell um, is missing a set of orbitals. The third shell just consists of these because these are pretty close in energy. So this is the third shell. And um, when we look at n equals 3, n equals 3, well, that's correct. But there's an n equals 3 up here as well. And so if we're looking at n equals 3 energy level, then it, it, the n equals 3 energy level kind of spans two shells. And then the fourth shell is here. But there's, there's missing orbitals. Where's the 4d? Where's the 4f? The 4d and the 4f are actually in higher energy shells because those are that penetrating. They're quite shielded. And so the fourth shell just consists of this. And so the n equals four actually is going to span, I think, two, two other shells. Makes it uh, tricky. Now the pattern, well, how do you know? Well, I just memorized that. But you know, you don't have to memorize it because there's a simple pattern that's easy to remember. Just like all this other stuff, you don't have to memorize every single orbital, all infinite of them. You just memorize these patterns. And when you memorize these patterns, it's a lot, a lot more effective. And so the pattern's like this, a 1s, 2s, 2p. This is a pattern for you know, figuring out you know, all of these. Somebody figured this out. I don't know who.
But so the pattern for the energies goes like this. 1F followed by 2F, 2P, 3F, 3P, 4F, 3D, 4P, 5S, 4D, 5P, 6S. Etc. And then this just steps out. And so, you know, the 6s would go from 6s all the way to 6 what? We have 6s, 6p, 6d, 6f, 6g, and 6h. Right? Yeah, I'll better write that down. 6P, 6D, 6F, 6G, 6H, etc. All right, so you should be able to go to the fourth shell. You know this to the fourth shell, or have it memorized the fourth shell. What happens is as Z increases, what's going to happen to the energies of the orbitals? You know, as Z increases, the energies go down for all the orbitals, and the orbitals become smaller in size as Z increases. <clears throat> So uh, the three quantum numbers, N, L, and M, just tell us you know, what the orbitals are, 400, 401, negative 1, 401, 0, Sometimes we leave the psi off there because it just gives too much space. You just write N L N M. All right, now um, we're going to talk about the three, you know, N L M define the orbital. We need a fourth quantum number. that defines the spin orientation. Which we call S, or M sub S. We'll just call it S. L sometimes is called M sub L, the magnetic quantum number. But, you know, there's electron spin. This is purely quantum mechanical. And so when we look at an electron, an electron can be spin up, Or an electron can be spin down. There are only two possibilities. Spin down. And so this is just a magnetic moment, you know, like north and south pole or dipole. If it's spin up, then um, the math of the Schrodinger equation assigns it a value of plus one half. If it's spin down, it's minus one half. And so the two uh, possible s values are plus one half and minus one half. Now let's talk about uh, filling um, the orbitals with electrons. We're going to try to get the ground state. What ground state means is just the lowest energy electron configuration. Lowest ground state equals lowest energy electron configuration. Wow. So to get the lowest energy electron configuration, one, we apply the off-bow principle. The off-bow principle, all that says is fill the lowest energy orbitals first. Fill lowest 
energy first. So it's just common sense. So, or maybe not. I don't know. Okay, uh, after the off balance principle, um, then we have to look at something called Hun's rule. Or actually, there are a number of things. It depends on um, how we do this. For energetically degenerate, energetically degenerate orbitals, fill one at a time with parallel spins. That is the same spin orientation. Three, um, we have to pay attention to something called the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons in the same atom. can have the same set of four quantum numbers. All right, so let's go ahead and fill some of these with the electrons here. We represent the electrons as arrows when we fill these. And so since I have this chart still up, we'll just use this chart here and rewrite it. For hydrogen, we can have a, um, actually, For hydrogen, we could um, have this. You know, when we look at the 1s orbital, we could either have the arrow pointed up or we could have the arrow pointed down. It doesn't matter. It's the same energy. It's the same energy unless you apply an external magnetic field. If you apply an external magnetic field, then they're different. But if in the absence of an external magnetic field, these are the same. This electron is called a 1, 0, 0, plus 1 half electron. This is N, L, M, and S. This electron here is called a 1, 0, 0, minus 1 half electron. Oh, no. The first three pinpoint the orbital. The fourth tells us the spin orientation. And so um, usually people fill these like, like this, with the uh, spin up. And then um, the next orbital, for helium, we have two electrons. And so the second would have to go spin down because they can't have the same set of four quantum numbers. And so this would be a 1, 0, 0, plus 1 half, or 1, 0, 0, minus 1 half. And then we go to lithium. Well, lithium, we're going to fill the 2s first. Why? Why do we fill the 2s? Because it's lower in energy. Why is it lower in energy than 2p? Because it's more penetrating, less shielded. And so we fill the 2s, spin up or spin down, or it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We could do spin up or spin down. By convention, most people do spin up. What's that electron called? Well, that electron is in a 2, 0, 0 orbital, and it's plus 1 half. So this is lithium. And then we go to beryllium. Beryllium is going to be spin down because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And then we go to boron. Which of these three should I fill first, or does it matter? Is the PX more stable than the PY? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter. This is an arbitrary Cartesian coordinate system anyway. 
And so I can fill any of these three, spin up or spin down. It doesn't violate. It, does this violate anything? If I, I, if I do the last orbital, spin down, is that a violation of anything? No, it's fine. This would be a two, one, one, negative one half. But the next electron, where would I put it? Would I fill this orbital? No, I'd have to put it in one of these two. It doesn't matter which one because they're all perpendicular or orthogonal to one another. And so I, but I could pick either one of these, but the electron has to be spin down because they have to be parallel spin. Well, usually what people do is they just go left to right, right, spin up. And so the first one would be beryllium and then boron. And then after um, boron comes carbon. Actually, I, I miscounted my electrons. This is a beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen. This is nitrogen. Once we're at ni nitrogen, is interesting because you know all these are half filled, and then we go to oxygen. Oxygen. Now we've run out of room, and we have to pair them. When we pair the electron, we just pick one of these. Pick the first one, pair that, etc. So this is how we generate it. And so it's easy. It's easy to know the quantum numbers for the orbital, and it's easy to know the quantum numbers for electrons. Can you figure it out? Uh, what's this electron called? What's that electron called? The electron's called a 3, 2, minus 1, minus 1 half electron. Now, if you didn't use quantum numbers, describe the electron for me. If you didn't use quantum numbers, you'd say, well, in the second orbital of the D subset, this is what we call subset or sub <coughs> sublevel. In the D sublevel, we have an electron that would spin down. Now, this is not very good, right? And so this is why we have these quantum numbers. Quantum numbers can quickly pinpoint and, and tell us exactly what electron we're talking about. All right, well, I said sublevel. Well, we have things called subshells. So if we have um, the second shell, there are two subshells in the second shell, the S and P. When we look at the third shell, the third shell only has three subshells, the S and the P. The fourth shell has three subshells, the S, the P, those are four, and the D. When we look at energy levels, the, the, the third energy level would have three sub-levels. The third energy level would have the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d. Do you see how it's kind of tricky when we're talking about energy level versus shell? All right, so this is uh, the basic of the periodic table because the first shell is the first period in the periodic table. The second shell is the second period, third shell is third period, fourth shell is fourth period, fifth shell is fifth period. A period is a row in the periodic table. Oops. And so let's take a look at the periodic table here. here. And um, the first uh, row here is the 1s orbital. 1s orbital can hold two electrons. Hydrogen has one electron, helium has the second electron here. This is also grouped into columns as well. And members of the column, members within the column will have similar chemical properties. And so hydrogen is kind of strange because hydrogen has properties of a non-metal over here and a metal. Even though hydrogen you typically think of as being a, a non-metal. But actually, um, oddly enough, solid hydrogen conducts electricity like a metal. You know, hydrogen tends to lose an electron like a metal. But hydrogen can gain an electron like a non-metal, so it's in two places here. So we have the second shell. This is a 2s with one electron, 2s with two electrons, and then the 2p. The 2p's can hold six electrons total. Here, going across. Nitrogen is going to be half filled. 
And so one electron in one key, another in another key, and another in another key. So it's so singly filled. And then oxygen will have to pair fluorine and neon. Once we hit neon, the whole shell is filled. When we fill a shell, like the first shell, you know, then uh, it has a, what we call a stable electron configuration. Now this would be the helium core. When we fill the second shell, that is completely filled like this, so we're at neon, then the second shell is filled, that's the neon configuration. We fill the third shell, then we get the argon configuration. The fourth shell will give us the krypton. They haven't filled shells as stable. And so the basis for the periodic table we can see is just um, uh, these shells. It's quite nice. Then. The fourth shell is a bit tricky. Um, so this is why they, they did it like this. They put the 4s. This is 4, but then this is 3d. So it's offset by one number. And then this is the 4p. 4s, 3d, 4p. And so we fill in the 4s first. That subshell, and then we'll fill in the 3D subshell completely with 10 electrons, and then we'll jump to the 4P subshell with yeah. eight electrons. And so we could use the periodic table to figure out electron, you know, um, where they are. And what we do here is we, we have different ways of representing this. You know, this takes up a lot of space, doesn't it? And so what do we call this diagram? We call this diagram an energy level diagram. But there are other diagrams that take up less space. In your homework, you use an orbital box diagram like this. In your homework, they don't have enough space to write it. And so typically, rather than writing an energy level diagram, they'll have an orbital box diagram. In the orbital box diagram, they will show 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, etc. The disadvantage, the advantage of the orbital box is it takes up a lot less room. The disadvantage is what? Yeah, we don't know the relative energies, you know, all these boxes are evenly in space. So the, you, we don't see the big gaps here and that the 2s and 2p are close, et cetera. So the orbital box diagram for neon would look like this. And here we filled up helium. And then here we fill up to neon. OK. When we look at this, we divide it. The outermost shell is called what? These are called the valence electrons. The inner, inner shells are called the core electrons. Now we have to be careful because in Chem 4 you learn the outermost shell. Well, technically it's not the outermost shell, it's the outermost electrons. And so the valence electrons, we're going to define it a little bit differently. The valence electrons are defined as the electrons in the highest n level or levels in the highest n levels. The reason we define it like this is because the fourth shell The fourth shell is funny because the fourth shell is a mix of valence and what we call core electrons. In the fourth shell, these are the valence electrons, the fours and the four P, so we have eight valence electrons. The D are not considered valence electrons. The Ds are actually considered core electrons, even though they're in the same shell. And the reason is because they're distant. 
you know, if you're looking at three, n equals three is like um, you know, nine times, you know, a naught or something like that. In other words, an n equals three is at a much closer distance to the nucleus than n equals four. It goes like this, n equals three, n equals four. And so n, n equals four, if there's gonna be attack on electrons, the outermost electrons will be attacked first. Followed by the inner. And so the valence electrons are where the chemistry happens, and it's, and it's what we call um, those different. All right, this is the orbital box, and then we have something called an electron configuration. Electron configuration is very compact. Electron configuration, we just call that 1s2 to represent two electrons in 1s, 2s2, 2p6. Okay, this is helium core, these are our balance here. Or an expanded, although I'm never gonna do the expanded, 1s2, 2s2, 2px2, 2py2, 2pz2. But we aren't going to do the expanded. All right, so uh, the periodic table is based on orbitals. So what we can do is we could figure out. Um, I'm not going to ask you to draw the energy level diagram for um, uranium. That'd be too much, right? 92 electrons in uranium. Let me get a periodic table up here. It's easier to see. There are two types of periodic tables. You'll see. These are the two types. You see those two blank spots here? What they did was they took these two and dropped them down here. This is called the F block. The F block has seven orbitals and take, take a total of 14 electrons. But you'll see the 15 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So what they did was they took some of the Ds and dropped them down here mix things up. I'm not going to do that. Let's look at a standard periodic table. Do we have a standard periodic table? Okay, here's a standard. Um, this is a standard periodic table. What we have to do is we have to follow the numbers. Follow the numbers means, okay, I want to do, let's do electron configuration. I'm going to do the electron configuration of tungsten, W. This is element number 74. And so if I ask you, what, what is electron configuration? Electron configuration is, this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, right, as we go down. This is n equals 4, but it goes n equals 4 to n equals 3 to n equals 4, because it's a shell. It's not an energy level, and n equals energy level. But anyway, this is 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 3, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2p6. We go on, right? We could do that. Or we could backtrack. 74, what's the nearest noble gap? The xenon. And so what we know is we filled the xenon shell. That's the core. And so we could start off with xenon. So if we're looking at tungsten, we could use Nobel gas core abbreviations, uh, which look like this. I just use um, xenon electron configuration, and then start after xenon. So starting after xenon, we go 54 to 55. 55 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6s. And so 6s1, 6s2 takes me to 56. So I built the 6s2. And then 57 is, 
what is this? This is three, four, five, that's 5D. So the 57th electron goes in 5D. Well, the 57th electron goes in 5D, where, where's the 58th electron? The 58th electron goes into 4F. This is a 4F. This is a 4F, this is 5F. And so, it gets mixed up. It gets mixed up because what happens is you get higher and higher in energy. As you get higher and higher in energy, what happens is the spacing between the energy levels gets smaller and smaller. And so there's, you know, there's other factors that come into play. And so we, we're going to look at some um, weird things with the electron configuration, but this is one of them. One of them is it goes 5D1, one electron there, and then 4F. You go 4F. 58 through 71 fills up the 4F. So we go 4F 14, and then we're back to 5D. So 71 to 72 so goes 5D 1, 2, 3. So an additional 3 5D electrons. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to combine these because these are all 5D electrons. And so what we could do here is we could go xenon, 6S squared, or 6S2. 4F14, and then 5D4. To better see the core versus valence electron, we do this. We write these in numerical order. So it would be 4F14, 5D4, 6S2. And the reason we write it in numerical order like this is because these are inner electrons. This is the outermost electron. And so when we look at tungsten, we say, oh, tungsten has two valence electrons. It has two valence electrons because it was the outermost. And so tungsten plus two should be a charge on tungsten if it loses those electrons to some oxidizer. But tungsten can be attacked further. For example, the next electrons susceptible to attack would be the 5D. You can take some of those. Okay, we're going to learn about two important exceptions to the filling um, next time. Well, we're not done yet with chapter 8 and 14. Okay, we're done today. Now. What's tomorrow's lab? Eight and nine. Eight and nine? Gosh. Okay, I'm behind. And so eight and nine deal with chapter 